Um, <clears throat> I just found out a friend of mine is being abused by someone I know, and she won't let me tell anyone. What do I do? I promised I would keep it a secret before I knew the whole story. That was where you made the mistake. <laughs> Um, I usually when I'm counseling or discipling, I tell people I will keep confidences unless it's a sin issue. And then um, if they don't repent, you can't do that because confidentiality without, or, yeah, without accountability is not biblical. So, um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, I don't know. I think I would go back to her and tell her that <clears throat> if the abuse is still going on, um, I don't know what kind of abuse you're talking about, if it's sexual, physical, if it's um, a family member, I, I, you know, it's, there's not a lot of information here, but if it's certainly against the laws of God and the laws of uh, Florida, you need to report it and you need to tell her that you've sinned against her and that um, by t promising her to do something that you can't do before God, because your loyalty goes to God before her. So. If uh, there's more information on that, you can email me and, or call me when I get to the airport and we can talk about it more. So I really like more information before I give a little more counsel on that. <clears throat> so just learn from that. That's one thing I've learned is I tell people I will keep confidences unless there's a sin issue that's not repented of and I can't do that before God. Um, the second question is Paul suffered need, why? doesn't God promise to provide for our needs? And then they cite Matthew 6 where Jesus says, you know, why worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to put on is not the life more than food and the body more than raiment, and behold the fowls of the air, etc. And then he says, for I, uh, don't worry about these things, for the Gentiles seek these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then these things will be added to you. Certainly there is, um, pro God has promised to supply all our needs, not our wants. And uh, we look at the example of the Apostle Paul, and I guess you could even look at the martyrs and say, well, you know, God didn't provide for them. He killed them. You know, he allowed them to suffer persecution to the point of death. And, um, yeah, you have to marry all that with the sovereignty of God, the passage that he loves the death of his children. The psalmist says God loves the death of his children. And so I do think that we can't bank on the fact that, you know, that God, we can't say, well, because God hasn't provided for this specific need that I have, that he's not, that he's a God who lies because he's a God who can't lie. And I think you have to ask yourself, is this a legitimate need? Is it a need or a want? Yeah, Paul was hungry, but he didn't die of hunger or, you know, and there are people that are dying all over the world of hunger. That's true. But I don't think we can fault God with not providing for them. He said, the poor you're always going to have with you. Me, you don't always have with you. So um, I think that's a, it's a good question. But um, I don't think we can go to Scripture and say that, you know, because this, you know, God hasn't provided the money for me this month to pay for my electric bill, that he's a God who lies. I would ask you, how are you spending your money this past month, you know? And so, uh, again more information on this question. I do think God's promised to supply what we need, but many times our needs are wants and not really legitimate needs. Um, but again, I more information on that question, and you can email me if you so desire. We can t dialogue w more about that. doesn't mean that there's some promise from God that we're not going to suffer, we're not going to die, we're not going to, you know, there's a lot of tragedy in the world and God that's part of the, the the problem from Adam and Eve was sin came into the world and so anyway there's just a that, this is a deep theological question <laughs> that we could spend a long time on but I have to catch a plane um, this is what I wanted this for when you have made confession and repented against sin to the Lord how do you determine if another person has genuinely come to repentance? That's a great question. I was just talking to that wife yesterday on the phone, and, you know, she said that her husband was, you know, saying, well, you know, he was just the pawn in God's sovereignty, and so the adulterous relationship he had for three years was all of a part of God's sovereignty. And I said, bogus. And I said, from the things you're telling me, your husband is not genuinely repentant. And I'd be very, very concerned because genuine repentance has certain signs to it. And Paul talks very clearly 
uh, in 2 Corinthians 7, 9 to 12 about what repentance looks like. And so um, this is a good way to determine whether you are just have godly sorrow like Esau, you're sorry you got your hand ca caught in the cookie jar, <laughs> or if it is sorrow that leads to repentance. And so he gives a list, and if you purchased uh, James or you have James, it's on page 263. But he lists these uh, seven ways that you can know. First of all, you're careful. In other words, a, a, a godly sorrow deals with the issues of sin in your life, but a worldly sorrow just produces a carelessness. You're just really not kind of like that man. Well, God's sovereign, so I was just the pawn in his, in his whole scheme of things to commit adultery with the pastor's wife for three years. No, I don't think so. Number two, a cleansing of yourself, Paul says. Someone who's truly repentant will seek the forgiveness of God and others. Worldly sorrow produces rationalizing your sin, excusing it, defending yourself. Thirdly, Paul says you have indignation. That means you have a righteous anger that you have offended a holy God. But a worldly sorrow is just anger because of the mess you're in. Fourthly, Paul says genuine repentance produces fear. Genuine sorrow produces a fear of God and fear of the fact that you have displeased him. But worldly sorrow produces a fear of the consequences that you're going to get for your sin. In this situation, this pastor had to step down from his pastorate because of his wife. Number five, vehement desire, a longing, a true person who's repentant, longs, has an intense craving to settle the issue and get all of the relationships restored. But worldly sorrow just produces a longing for, does not produce a longing for true restoration. Number six, zeal. A person who's truly repentant has a zeal to remove sin and see the work of reformation with a great zeal. A worldly sorrow will be content to be lethargic about sin. There's no battle against sin, no hatred for sin, no fighting against sin. And then lastly, Paul says, the seventh sign that you know someone is repentant is full punishment. In other words, this produces an avenging of the wrong. The person no longer tries to protect himself, no matter what the cost. Worldly sorrow produces no effort to correct the problem, which is the heart. So those are some great signs. Here, Deb, thanks. And you can study those out for yourself. That's 2 Corinthians. And Paul is very clear uh, what genuine repentance looks like. And, of course, he's just dealt with the man who had committed incest uh, from 1 Corinthians. And into 2 Corinthians, he said that man's repented. Now forgive him and restore him into your fellowship. And so a very good passage in dealing with what genuine. And those are the things that I look for, and those are the things that I counsel women when they're dealing with a husband who's been unfaithful or some type of sin issue. I'll say, well, genuine repentance has genuine signs to it according to the Bible, and so those are the things you want to look for when looking at whether someone's repentant or not. I can tell. Thank you so much and Christ within you grateful for you thank you that's not a question but that's nice <laughs> okay what are some examples of how you edify and strengthen your husband I know you both are busy and demanding schedules for ministry um, I pray for my husband every day that's one way that I um, edify or strengthen him he doesn't know that but I do um, I encourage him um, I also I know this that maybe doesn't sound like edifying, but when I think he's really bombed a sermon, I tell him or something. <laughs> I don't really understand what you were saying, but anyway, um, I, you know, in fact, somebody asked Doug one time, who holds you accountable? And he goes, are you serious? Do you know my wife? <laughs> and so um, he says, I wish I'd never taught her how to memorize scripture. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> and I do, that's one way I edify and strengthen him is to lovingly confront him, but I don't, I, I really weigh what's important. You know, I, you know, there's so many things you just need to overlook. Love covers a multitude of sins. I don't make issues out of non-essentials. And um, I've learned how to graciously appeal to him. I've learned how to just wait and pray. And many times the Lord just changes things. Um, but I, I'm, I'm, you know, my husband and I, we have a good relationship, and I speak the truth to him in love. And, and uh, he does me as well. So um, anyway, that's how I would edify and strengthen him. Um, Jonathan Edwards would think about the torments of hell and the tortured martyrs in order to put his own trials into perspective. What do you do in your own trials, or do you allow, or do you follow a similar method? Not so much. Um, 
You know, Peter says, uh, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that there are throughout the world. And so, you know, there's no temptation taken us, but such as is common to man, God is faithful. He will with a way make a way of escape so that you can bear it. And so for me, a way of escape during times of temptation and trials are uh, reminding myself of what I already have memorized. I, I rehearse scripture in my mind. Uh, like this morning, even with the little bit of an issue I had with my husband, like, please don't unplug my, you know, I immediately start begin rehearsing scripture and what I know to be true and praying and just leaving it in the Lord's hand and moving on. And so uh, there are times that, you know, just you know, that I'll visit with a woman and go and she'll tell me about her deep sorrows or trials and and it does put perspective on my own trials, like really, I'm, I'm not suffering at all compared to this person. So, but I don't dwell on that so much. I just know what I, what I should be doing and that is taking my thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ and transforming my mind. And so when Peter wrote that, um, he was writing to the persecuted Christians that many of them were being beaten for their faith. Many of them were being set to fire as torches for Nero's garden and uh, we're being killed for their faith. And he says, you know, just uh, resist him, steadfast in faith, cast your cares on him, he cares for you. And so I do a lot of those things when I'm going through trials. But um, I actually didn't know that fact about Jonathan Edwards. But um, anyway, that's what I do. How do you keep someone from stealing your joy? Kind of what we just talked about, I don't focus on the circumstances, I don't focus on the people, I take my thoughts captive, I memorize God's word, I rehearse what I've memorized. I also like to listen to really good Christian music. Uh, probably most of you have you know, some type of a, something on your phone. I have Pandora radio set to the music stations that I personally like, the music that personally lifts my heart to worship. So a lot of times um, I'll just put my earbuds in and, and start praising the Lord. And you know, so what Jehoshaphat did, when he said, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. And it says, when they begin to praise and worship the Lord, the Lord acted and intervened for Jehoshaphat. And so uh, music is great. For me personally, I love music. I like to sing. I, and so that has helped me a lot. Uh, if I'm feeling that my joy might be taken away, I just praise the Lord. And it's, as my friend says, who mentors me, one of my mentors, she says, Susan, it's amazing what praising can do. <laughs> and... Uh, she lives in Oklahoma, she's 82, but she's from Georgia. And then if I really am really struggling and I can't seem to get victory doing all the things I know to do, I'll ask someone to pray for me and hold me accountable. And about six or, six or eight weeks ago when all this was you know, coming to fruition, I was trying to pack the house and go for all these trips and just be a pastor's wife and I mentor several women. It's just almost overwhelming. And for three or four days, I really just felt like I might have a heart attack, and I thought, this is sin. <laughs> this has got to stop this. And so um, I asked one of my friends to pray for me and hold me accountable and help me. So, you know, sometimes we need those Aaron and hers to hold our hands up when we can't do it anymore, fight the battle. So ask others to pray for you and to help you. Um, how do you discipline yourself to choose what is worthwhile for God's glory? Um, last night's lesson is really good. I'm also going to talk about a little bit about this in the next session, about a purpose statement. And so for me, and I think I, excuse me, if you're going to be here the next session, I'll share a little bit more about that. But I did give all those questions last night on how to choose what is most excellent. But I'll share a little bit more next session. How do, you, how do I control my emotions? Stop it. That's what I say. Stop it. <laughs> You guys know what I'm talking about. Have you ever seen that YouTube, Paul Newman, when the lady comes in with the fear that she's going to be buried alive in a box? Have any of you seen that? It's hilarious. In fact, someone sent it to me one time, and they said, this is what I imagine your counseling sessions to be like. <laughs> I mean, not Paul Newman. It was Paul Newhart. And he just goes, well, stop it. Stop it, you know. So, um, in fact, I used to have a discipling motto called snap out of it, but I don't anymore. So I'm trying to, you know, practice mercy and compassion. Um, but, you know, the Bible does have a lot to say about women and their emotions. In fact, Paul says to Titus, older women teach young women to be self-controlled. In other words, to have their emotions under control. So um, I would find whoever wrote this, find an older woman that can help you learn how to control your emotions and to teach you and um, walk with you during that. And that Paul, God's provided that through an older woman. So uh, find one, a good one, a godly one. 
Um, is it biblical for a woman to remain single, and how would you know whether you have the gift of singleness? Um, yes, Debbie is single. Uh, I know a lot of single women. Um, if you have the gift of singleness, I think you would just have that drive. You would not have a drive to be married or have children. That You would just, you know, I'm discipling a young woman right now, and she has no desire to be married, but she does have a desire to serve the Lord completely and wholeheartedly. And so I think God will just put that burden within your heart. Um, if a woman does remain single, how would, you, how would she utilize her gift? Oh, my, there's so many ways. Paul says an unmarried woman carries for, cares for the things of the Lord, how she may please him, but a married woman cares for the things of her husband. And so uh, as a single woman, you have so many advantages that a married woman does not have because you can fully give your life to the Lord and serve him. So I would say find out what your spiritual gifts are, whether you're married or single, and start using them. <laughs> whatever they are, and start using them to the glory of God. Um, have you ever tried memorizing two books of the Bible at the same time? And so did it get, no, I never have, and I don't <laughs> plan to. <laughs> it's hard enough, just one. No, I, and I am, uh, no, I'm, I start with a book, and I finish it, and I review it correctly so that I have it, and then I move on to the next one. So I would not try that. I mean, you can, but I think it would be very difficult. Now, I have known women that have started memorizing a book of the Bible, and they say, you know, I really want to stop, and I want to go memorize a psalm and come back to it. And I said, well, that, that'd be good. But I personally, unless you just have an unbelievable brain, I, I couldn't do that. In fact, a lot of times I'll be reviewing, like, First John, and all of a sudden I'm in the Gospel of John. Like, how'd I get there? Well, because John writes a lot of the same things in First John and John. Or I've memorized the Gospel of Matthew, and John, and sometimes there's similar stories. And I've looked at Mark, and Mark is so much like Matthew. I'm like, that's one of the books I haven't memorized. I'm like, I'm not sure I'm going to, because I think I might really get confused. So um, how, do you, how do we listen to you on Worldview Radio, www.worldviewweekend.com? But I think it's on the brochure, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Oh, that, is it not on that? I think it's on that, too. Didn't you, did you write it on that? Yeah, it's on there. So... Um, worldviewweekend.com. You'll see my mug shot, even though I don't look anything like that now. That was taken about 15 years ago. I was thinner, no gray hair, and you know, so, uh, but you'll see me. I'm the only woman on that radio program. The others are, there's about, I think you've had several of them. Mike Abendroth is on Worldview Weekend. Justin Peters is on Worldview Weekend. So, um, anyway, you'll find me on there. Yes, right there at the bottom of my, see, I told you I don't look anything like that. <clears throat> Uh, what advice would you give to young ladies that want to be saved and follow the Lord? I know God is the one who saves us, and I don't want to be uh, just mo morally conformed. It's difficult with the pulls of this world. How would you advise us to handle friendships with other girls that we're around but don't have interest in the things of the Lord? Um, you know, Paul told young Timothy, flee youthful lusts. Flee youthful lusts, but follow after righteousness, faith, love, peace. Um, so I would tell you, encourage you, uh, yes, God is the author of salvation. If you don't know the Lord, just keep pursuing him. Um, ask him to save you. Um, but I would not, you know, the Bible also says bad company corrupts good morals. I have known young women who have fallen due to picking wrong girlfriends. And so I choose my friends very carefully. It's not that I don't minister to people that are lost and pagan and ungodly, but I don't spend the bulk of my time with them because we become like the people we hang out with. In fact, the Bible says don't be around an angry person lest you learn their ways. And so I think that goes for anything. <clears throat> if you hang or you notice it, if you know how men and women, as they're married, they become like each other. And if you're married to a husband that complains, it's probably very difficult for you not to become a complainer because you, you, you tend to be like the person you spend time with. And I've, I've shared those stories with you about the two ladies that disciple me and, and how the one, you know, she had a habit of <laughs> snorting every time she laughed. <clears throat> and so after a year into our discipling relationship, I found myself snorting <laughs> after every laugh. And I was like, well, that's not very feminine. And so I started becoming like her. And, um, you know, my husband's even made some notes about, like, one particular person. He said, I'm glad you don't spend as much time with her anymore because he said, I noticed you were becoming very critical like she is. So, um, and the other lady that disciples me, she, she's from the South. She's the one that says, it's amazing what praising can do. And uh, <clears throat> one, one summer, my son came home from seminary, and he said, Mom, there's something really different about you. 
And I was going to say, yeah, he's going to say, you know, you're so much more spiritual than you used to be. Now, he didn't say that. He said, you're wearing more jewelry than you used to. Well, guess what? My mentor, Carolyn, she wears a necklace and earrings and a bra you know, so I, you know, I was like, well, that's really attractive. I'm going to start doing that. So um, I would share with you as a young girl, I would be very careful about the friends you choose and I would not give in to the world's pressure. Do not let the world squeeze you into its mold and it's okay to be a fool for Christ's sake. The Bible says we're strangers, we're aliens. And so, um, I mean, I'd be gracious, but just say, you know, I just really, I, I can't get involved in this activity. I can't spend time with you. I'm sorry. Or I know people try to swim upstream and conform the other person. It makes me crazy when people get married and I say, you know, you shouldn't marry that person. They're not very godly. Well, I'm going to conform them. No, you're not. They're going to conform you. And that's usually what happens. So be careful. Now, I have not seen these questions, so I'll see if um, the other ones I kind of went through my mind a little bit. What was the pastor that had harmony for 50 years? Oh, R.C. Chapman. Does he have books? I think he does. R.C. Chapman, a pastor in the 1800s. Um, okay. <clears throat> How can we serve without feeling we're neglecting our duties as a wife, mother, daughter? Um, well, I think your first duty is to your home. You're to be, a, you're to, that is your first calling to your home. You should be making sure you're keeping your home in order, keep her at home, uh, attend to the domestic affairs of your household. That's what Titus 2 says, Proverbs 31. She looks well to the ways of her household. She doesn't eat the bread of idleness. So make sure that you're being the wife, mother, and everything you should be first. And then you should also be using your gifts and talents for the Lord. And so um, I, I would talk to your husband. If you're married, talk to your husband about this. What does he feel like you have time to do. I have a friend in Florida, a different part of Florida. She was heading up the women's ministries and she just had to bow out. I mean, she's a mother, she homeschools four kids and she was head of women's ministries and she was burning the candle at both ends. And her husband's finally said, enough is enough. So she has stepped out of heading up women's ministries right now, but she's serving in other ways in the church. So um, just remember your first duties to your home. And I would talk to your husband about it. I'd pray about it. And, uh, but you should be serving in some capacity. We all should be using our gifts. In being content, is there such a thing as taking contentment too far and not caring at all about anything? I feel that way. Is that sin? <laughs> well, I, I don't know what you mean about not caring about anything, but, you know, um, I don't know that you can take contentment too far, but you don't want to become apathetic or immune to other people's hurts and needs. If you're saying that, yeah, that's not good. Um, but, the, but as far as being content and, you know, people hate you and they persecute you or your husband, you know, is harsh with you and you can let that roll off your back, I'd say that's great. You've learned contentment and to not allow people to, to steal your joy or your peace, that's good. Um, but if you're talking about being immune to the cares of others, then that's not good. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure what you're asking, but you can come see me. If, you, if I didn't answer that correctly. How can a wife encourage her husband who struggles with contentment? Well, I actually am discipling someone now whose husband is like that. And she says that what she does, and I think it's really good. Um, in fact, when all this started, now this isn't me, but when all this started with our moving and, and everything, my husband said, Susan, I, I really wish you didn't have all these speaking engagements coming up. And I said, well, I'll cancel them. He said, no, I don't want you to cancel. And I said, well, honey, God knew that. He knew that we were going to move and all this was going to, and he will give us grace, you know. So I think just lovingly remind, if your husband struggles with, my husband doesn't. My husband is the ultimate optimist and, um, and he loves life and all that. But I think just lovingly reminding them of, of God's word and um, you don't be a nag and don't be his mother but, or his Holy Spirit, but you graciously just remind them of God's faithfulness. And what we do have, but honey, we look what God's provided for us. And so I would combat the negativism and the lack of content with things that God has done for you. And you live a life of contentment. Don't let him see you complaining. And uh, so I would live that before him. And maybe he needs to be discipled. Maybe you need to find, you know, say, honey, have you ever considered... Um, you know, getting with the pastor from time to time or elder so-and-so or ever considered a discipling relationship because it seems like you really have fallen into this sin and I would call it sin. 
you have fallen into this sin of discontent and it's really affecting our marriage and our home and maybe you need to pray about meeting with another man that could help you in this area so you could say something like that do you really have two stomachs yes medically and literally I do I have the x-rays to prove it so what happened was most of you know the story when I was 30 God inflicted me with severe pain put me in the hospital flat on my back Two weeks isolation, I didn't get to see my kids, my husband, nothing. And uh, that was the time God saved me because I was, I thought I was a Christian, but I was living a life of hypocrisy and sin. And uh, you know, Charles Haddon Spurgeon says, what you are at home is what you are. And what I was at home was not what I was at church. And so those two weeks in the hospital, I was flat on my back and then six more weeks at home and the pain was not related to having two stomachs, but it was another uh, situation. I had a, uh, uh, the main artery going up to my heart was kinked, he said, like a water hose and that was what was causing the pain. But anyway, in all that process, they ran me through every test under the sun because I was vomiting uncontrollably. I mean, it was just a bad deal, but it's what God used to save me, so I'm thankful for it now. And because I began to see my hypocrisy and I repented for the first time, saw myself as a sinner. But anyway, my doctor happened to be an elder in our church. And so he came in one day and he said, um, I bet it costs a lot to feed you. And I was like, what? And he goes, uh, do you have a good appetite? And I go, yeah, I can out eat, out eat any of my girlfriends. And he said, well, do you know you have two stomachs and they both function? And I was like, no, I didn't know that. But I said, that sure explains a lot. So anyway, he put the x-ray on the thing and he showed it to me. And uh, yes, I have two stomachs and they both function. So um, I can prove it by the x-rays. You know, I met one lady one time. She, was, uh, she told me she had two uteruses and she had to have one removed because it was causing problems. So, I mean, we're fearfully and wonderfully made and I'm weirdly made. In fact, <clears throat> a few years ago, I went to go get a root canal and the periodontist called in all his employees and he said, look at this woman's mouth. She has double roots and double canals. He said, I've never seen this in all my practice. So I think, and this is what my husband thinks, I was supposed to be a twin and I mutated <laughs> because my husband says, if I die, he's got to get seven wives to, to replace me because I have the energy of about seven women too, so I'm very high energy and very disciplined and organized, and so um, I don't know, but I, I, I could very possibly, I, I don't know what else I have to, uh, but <laughs> anyway, it's true and I can prove it, I'm not lying. Uh, I'm a victim of molestation and I feel it affects my relationship with my husband. I want to submit to my husband and obedient towards God. How can I let go of such a memory? Um, we're going to talk about that next session quite a bit, forgetting what is behind and moving on. I actually, I'm going to talk quite a bit about that. Um, but I would say scripture memorization is huge in transforming your mind, renewing your mind. Um, I also was a victim of molestation, and I have no ill will. I don't think about it. The person's never asked for my forgiveness, and it wasn't my dad. And... Uh, but, um, and I also was, when I was in fourth grade, I also watched my sixth grade best friend. Her name was Rose Joyner. I also watched her be tied to a tree and be molested. And we had to go and identify two young boys who had done that to her. And it was kind of a creepy time. But, um, you know, I think, I think that's more common than we realize that many of us have been molested either by a, a father or uncle or cousin or brother or something like that. So um, there is victory and there is hope in Christ and uh, we can talk about that more in the next session. And um, I don't know of any good books out there. I've done a lot of counseling on sexual abuse and honestly, I wouldn't recommend any of the books because they're so um, perverted and they talk about that stuff and I don't, I wouldn't, don't wanna fill your mind with more sexual perversion. So, um, but you know, I would, um, I'd read the scriptures, I studied the scriptures, I would memorize scripture that pertain to that particular problem. The passage we're gonna look at after lunch would be great for getting those things which are behind and pressing on toward the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So anyway, thank you for your time and goodbye. Nope. <laughs>